begin by praising and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this very special moment that he has blessed us with to share together to learn about this beautiful deen of Islam and the beautiful messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but before I venture any further I would like to take the liberty of bringing to your attention something very important which is not related to my topic tonight but I performed Taraweeh at another place and we finished slightly earlier than yourselves and I did leave there as soon as I could to be here on time uh, but as I came to the vicinity or within the surroundings of the masjid I was extremely disappointed to see what I witnessed and I'm going to ask you all a question in response to which you'll be asked to raise your hands and you don't have to but just to give me an idea before I make the point that I want to make how many of you dads have come this evening with your teenage son or sons from the age of eight or seven upwards all the way Mashallah, quite a few of us Alhamdulillah It is a wonderful thing That is our duty, we have to do that The Quran is extremely clear About the responsibility of parents towards their offspring Towards their children In fact we have the responsibility to save Not only ourselves But also our families from the wrath and the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the punishment of Allah Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara I can see some of you dads have your young ones seated next to you or near you but those of us who have come with our youngsters and you don't see your son or sons anywhere in the four walls of this masjid I think you need to find out where they are uh, our Imams might disagree with what I have to say but I would say you would rather leave them at home than bring them to the masjid and then not know where they are whilst you are in Salah we have neighbors there is the neighborhood of the masjid and we know that what youngsters can do when they get together just one has to start off something and all the bad habits are picked up in no time and we will be fighting a losing battle we bring them to the masjid to make them spiritually aware and raise their awareness of Islam unfortunately some of us tend to think only of ourselves and we present ourselves into the main hall Alhamdulillah we benefit from the Taraweeh not knowing where our youngster is we are responsible for what they are doing outside the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is very very clear kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyyati each one of you is like a shepherd and each one of you is responsible and answerable for their flock, for the actions of their flock if you're a father, you've come with your son or your sons you are responsible for their actions outside and indeed for their actions inside and nobody else can be held responsible for that so my plea to all of you including myself is that please bring your young ones with you but keep them with you encourage them to be with you so you have all knowledge, you have full knowledge of what they have been up to I think it's a wonderful experience and a very satisfying experience to read your taraweeh with your young son or your young sons beside you what, what more enjoyment and pleasure could one hope for in this blessed month of Ramadan to be next to your young ones to know that they are there with you in the presence of Allah So please keep an eye on, uh, on the young ones that you, you bring to the masjid. It's extremely important. I've read to, 
for you a number of verses from the Quran and a number of hadith the sayings of our blessed messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and all these can be presented in one sentence that the blessed messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the best and the only role model for all of humanity there can be no other role model not only for muslims but for any human being man or woman young or old in the time of the messenger in contemporary times and in future he will be the perfect role model the best role model for the last person that is to be born on this planet and if we look at our own lives either as muslims or as human beings we find that there is always someone that we look up to that we try to emulate someone who inspires us someone from whom we draw strength and courage it could be our father our mother other family members our teacher the maths teacher the science teacher the quran teacher the fiqh teacher it could be our good neighbors it could be an honest businessman and trader it could be a professional who is very good at his profession in the service of humanity it could be a footballer for many of our young ones here it could be wayne rooney how many of you look up to wayne rooney as a role model no one come on it can't be you mean there are no man u fans here man u fans hands up there you are yes wayne rooney fantastic football player role model for many young people and why not for those of us who are maybe much older maybe Gary Lineker Kenny Dalglish and many others in the past Pele Muhammad Ali the boxer so many others Amir Khan the new british budding talent role models people look up to these role models that that is an example for me and a lot of these role models do have some very nice things to teach others yes indeed there are some things that we can pick and choose from their lives to inspire us muhammad ali is one perfect example of such a role model who fought for the rights of black people in america so there are many things that we can pick up in the lives of these people however none of them none of them were perfect role models or are perfect role models or will be perfect role models they will always have every single one of them will always have shortcomings will have deficiency many deficiencies few deficiencies maybe just one deficiency but none of them is perfect and therefore they cannot be our proper role models they can be role models every now and then but they are not role models when you clap in the face of the referee when he shows you a yellow card because then you get a, a red card even if you are Wayne Rooney you have to walk off the, walk off the pitch you have to be disciplined you have failed to be that role model that you could have been for all british youngsters sometimes you learn a lesson the very next game i've been told he was the best behaved player on the football field i think they played liverpool and he was very well behaved and i don't think that lasted for long because soon after he was back to his old self so for us as muslims and for humanity the only true perfect permanent role model 
is of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and there can be no doubt about that. And I shall illustrate this by sharing with you some of his characteristics, many of which will be known to you. But when we remind ourselves of these things, they inspire us. They light up the flames of Iman in our hearts. The love for the Blessed Messenger increases. Allah says in the Quran that if you love Allah, He tells Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to tell us, that tell these people that if you love Allah, فَاتَّبِعُونِي You have to follow my ways. You have to make me your role model. Then Allah will love you. Not otherwise. If Wayne Rooney is your role model and you expect Allah to love you, not likely. But if I, Muhammad, am your role model, then Allah will definitely love you. So the way to the love of Allah is through the love and the obedience of the Blessed Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then we are loved by Allah. One thing is to love somebody. It's quite easy. To love somebody is quite easy. We love our wives, mashallah, those who are married. We love our children, alhamdulillah. We love our teachers, our imams, our neighbors and friends and so forth. But to be loved, to be loved, that I think is more important. Because then it is the other person that gives you the love that makes room for you in their life and in their heart. To love Allah is one thing, but if Allah says, I love you, that is what we should aspire to. For Allah to love us, that should be our goal. And this is what made the Sahaba anhum ecstatic. Their joy knew no bounds. When Allah declared to them in the Quran, Radiyallahu anhum wa radu an, that Allah is pleased with them, Allah loves them, and they are pleased with Allah and they love Allah. Because they had made their role model Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and nobody else. That is why they were able to achieve and be told in this worldly life, while they were alive, that Allah loves you. Just reflect on our own personal lives. All of us, we have people around us who we love, and people who love us. And when they tell you they love you, how do you feel? So much joy comes to your, to your heart. You feel so nice, your little one comes up to you, Daddy, I love you. Your wife tells you, my dear husband, I love you. Your teacher tells you, you've done well in class. Well done. You are a good pupil. You're a good student. That is an expression of love. They like what you've done. They love you for what you've done. It makes us feel so nice, so proud and so good. Imagine Allah telling us that I love you. And Allah will love us. Provided we make Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam our role model then his love is guaranteed written for time in memorial and for time until Allah decides otherwise in the passages of the Quran so let us reflect on his life what kind of role model did he present for us as Muslims for us as human beings the best of Allah's creation the creation that Allah modeled with His own hands as they are in His own wisdom and His qudra. We do not describe Allah's hands. But Allah modeled this human being. And Allah blew life into this human being. Special care was taken. The best model was given to this human being. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ no room for improvement. There's no one who will say we should have two more eyes in the back so we can see when we're reversing our cars, we can see properly. That will not work. This is the model. 
So this human being that is so special, so specially created, needs a role model that is just as special. That will enable this human being to utilize his and her total faculties in drawing close to Allah, in being one with Allah. The mind, the heart, the sight, the hearing, the talking, actions of the hand and feet, all these will work collectively to enable this person to become close to Allah, to be loved by Allah. The Quran declares that the Blessed Messenger وسلم, was successful in attracting people to himself because he was a gentle person. He was a kind, merciful person. And Allah tells him, O Messenger, had you been hard-hearted, vulgar in your language, angry and all the other negative behaviors that some human beings possess, if you were like that, then everyone who was around you would have scattered and gone away. But in a very short period of time, of 23 years, the whole of the Arabian Peninsula was declaring, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did he achieve this? The Blessed Messenger himself said that I have been sent to this world to bring to perfection all good character. He said I have been sent to this world not as a source of curse and hardship and difficulty for humanity but I have been sent as a source of mercy. The Quran says that Messenger we have sent you to the world as a source of mercy for everyone. Not for Muslims only, for everyone. Every single one, not just human beings, for animals, for every one of God's creation, a source of mercy. What kind of mercy did he distribute? Let us reflect on his life and then see where we stand, how we are doing. MashaAllah, we've performed our salah, we observe the fasting give our zakah inshallah and perform the hajj that is only a part of Islam a very small part if, my, if I may add that is a very small part of Islam the larger part of Islam is elsewhere and we find it in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam how did he engage with people around him Britain is now our home Many of our youngsters, our children are born in this country. They have no other home. And sometimes when you listen to debates on radio shows and television shows and people who say you should go back to your countries and you should go back where you came from if you don't like Britain. They miss the whole point that these Muslims, a large majority of Muslims were actually born in these isles. This is their home. There is nowhere else that they can call home. We live in Britain, this is our home. It is, not, it is not a Muslim society. It is not a Muslim country. It is a multicultural, multi-faith, pluralist, secular society. Which simply adds more challenges to the life of a Muslim. A Muslim living in a Muslim society finds it reasonably easy and simple, if you like, manageable to live a life of Islam. But you live in a society like ours, huge, huge challenges. Needs tremendous courage, enthusiasm, love for Islam, love for the deen, love for Allah and His Messenger. So we live in a society where people who are very different to us are our neighbors of many faiths and of none, of many ethnicities, many languages, many cultures, very different to us, very different to our way of life, their religions very different to our own. Occasionally many similarities, 
religions that believe in the one God religions that believe in previously revealed scripture the Torah, the Zabur, the Injil these are our neighbors, these are our fellow countrymen and women, our cit fellow citizens and we live with them in this country we work with them we work for our country we work for the prosperity of our country how did the blessed messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam educate the sahaba radhiyallahum when they needed to engage in such a kind of environment because in the early days of islam arabian society was just like ours there was a mixture of all kinds from idol worshippers to monotheists, monotheists who believed in one God. And it was in this kind of society that they lived their Islam in such a way that the annals of history show us very clearly that in a short period of time droves and droves of people in their hundreds came and embrace this way of life of total submission to Allah and today I'm not going to focus on how the blessed messenger dealt with fellow Muslims but let us look at how he dealt with non-Muslims because I'm beginning to become increasingly worried about some of our attitudes especially the attitudes of our youngsters towards non-Muslims because of the current political climate I might add that it is such a complex situation the wars in Afghanistan and the current troubles in Iraq it's a very complex situation and I can understand the frustrations that many young people are going through but we have to be extremely careful not to tar every non-Muslim with the same brush just as we wanted and we demanded after 9-11 that if you have proven and if you can prove that it was Muslims who did it then it was just that group of Muslims not us not every Muslim don't blame us don't expect an apology from us because we have nothing to do with it just as after the London bombings we demanded that if it is proven, if they can prove it that it was Muslims who did it don't tar us with the same brush they were individuals, they were not representing us as a, as a community so don't blame us for what they did likewise it is only fair that we as Muslims do not blame every non-Muslim for our troubles it is not your average British person on the street who is responsible for what's happening in Iraq. It is not your average Hindu neighbor, Hindu colleague, Hindu British citizen on the street who is responsible for what happens in Gujarat. It is not your average Jewish person walking our streets here who is responsible for what's happening for decades now in the occupied lands in Palestine. We have to be able to make a distinction otherwise we will fail to implement the model of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam because then our minds will become befogged we will not be able to think straight look at how Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam dealt with non-muslims with the mushrikun the idol worshippers the polytheists with the Jews, with the Christians, with the pagans you will have heard this story many a time that in the early days of his mission Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would walk the streets and the alleys of Makkah calling people to the oneness of God يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ قُولُوا لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ تُفْلِحُونَ 
O people, declare that there is one God and you will be successful. Very few accepted his message. A lot of them were very abusive. And in particular there was one old woman who made it her daily job that whenever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed by her house she would throw rubbish at him. She would throw rubbish on him. Just imagine, just put yourself in that position. For a Muslim cleanliness, personal hygiene is so important. At-tuhuru shatrul iman. Personal hygiene is half of your faith. We cannot pray salah without wudu. You have conjugal relations with your wife, with your husband. You have to have the ghusl, the full bath. You cannot touch the Quran and read it without wudu. Personal hygiene. Your clothes are stained by blood or urine. You have to change them, you have to wash them. Personal hygiene. For all of us as Muslims, imagine the level of hygiene of the Blessed Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the purest of the pure. The books of Hadith have recorded that when he answered the call of nature, what you and I need to clean, for him it was full of fragrance. That is the level of hygiene that Allah had blessed him with. Yet he had to endure every day this dirt that was being thrown on him. What would you and I have done? Just think. Be honest with yourself. Tell yourself what would you have done. Don't kid yourself. Just be very honest with yourself. What would you have done? And perhaps we have done many things. Somebody irritates us, says just one thing that is hurtful, painful, disrespectful, whatever it might be. And we're up in arms. We simply cannot tolerate. The sabr is not there. And we want to lash out. Not equally. Maybe ten and twenty times more. The blessed messenger not once complained to her. One day there was no dirt being thrown on him. He became worried. We would have said, this is good. Don't have to wash myself today and change my clothes. Perhaps she's dead, she dead, good riddance. But not the blessed messenger. Because he was a source of mercy, lil alameen, for every single human being. Even though for those who punished him and tortured him in this manner. He felt for every human being, for everyone who left the face of this earth without acknowledging the oneness of Allah, he cried for them. He wept at night for them. Today we are very quick to say kafir this and kafir that and kafir that. Find me from the books of hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam using similar language. You will not. For he had a desire for these people to find Allah. That was his mission. That is our mission. He inquired about this old woman. Went up to her house. Knocked on the door. A voice asked, asked who's at the door and he said it is I, Muhammad. And now the woman was trembling. Because she thought, this is it. Today I will die. Because for all those days and weeks that I have troubled Muhammad, today he's had the last stroke. He's come to exact his revenge, he's going to kill me. He re reassured her through the door. My respectful mother, I wish you no harm. I do not want to hurt you. I've simply come to ask after you. Are you well? Is something the matter with you? And it so happened that she was poorly. She was unwell. 
not well enough to throw rubbish on him. And that was it. That was enough for this woman. She realized that a man who I have treated so badly has come to ask after me. Surely this is the true messenger of Allah. True messenger of God that he feels for me. He wants to ask if I am well, if there is anything I need. Ask ourselves what have we done for our neighbors when we haven't seen them for a day or two. And I'm not saying we should be nosy and poke our noses in our neighbor's business. We all know the boundaries, we all know where to draw the line. When have we knocked on our neighbor's door to say, I haven't seen you for a few days, are you okay? Is everything alright with you? Whether they are Muslim or not. We have to live in this country as role models for others. They have a right over us. Just as that old woman had a right over the blessed messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam They have a right over us Why have we become so selfish? Why have we adopted this holier than thou attitude that we the Muslims we are the ones that's it And everybody else is going to go to hell That's not what the blessed messenger did The Quran is very clear the Quran told him that that those who reject Allah will end up there. But he would not give up without a fight. He would work at it, work at it. So much that staunch enemies, people who had wanted to kill him. We hear the story of Umar radiallahu anhu. So drawn, ready to go and kill the blessed messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His heart was turned, he became Muslim. As the second khalifa, this masjid is named in his honor. He will be remembered until the day of judgment. That is the love he had for the creation. This, is not a, this was not a Muslim woman. Remember that. That is the point I want to make. Sadly, we even fail with fellow Muslims. Let alone non-Muslims. And I do not wish to take away anything from those who are doing a wonderful job. Those of you who are living in the true spirit of Islam, in the role model of the Blessed Messenger, may Allah reward you abundantly. But I'm speaking in very broad terms. So if you feel that you are not part of this, then do exclude yourself and thank Allah. But if we are guilty of this, we have to make corrections. Something has gone wrong somewhere. A Muslim hates a bad act a Muslim dislikes an evil act but not the person who carries it out it's very important the blessed messenger disliked and hated kufr he hated shirk but not the kafir not the mushrik because potentially they were believers if we work on them they will become believers They have some good things in them as human beings. If we help them to shine in those good qualities, maybe better things will come out of their lives. And perhaps one might feel, well, it was just an old lady, old woman, about to die anyway. So he had to be nice to her. Returning from a battle, the blessed messenger lay down to rest. The Sahaba laid down to rest, found some shady place and fell asleep. From a distant distance, an enemy scout saw the Muslims resting. He recognized the blessed messenger, sleeping, his sword hanging from the tree, unaware of what's happening. This enemy thought, now is my chance. If I kill him, it is the end of our problems as they saw it. He moved very quickly. He took the blessed messenger's sword and woke him up very rudely. Man yasimuka minni ya Muhammad. Muhammad who will protect you now from me? Your sword is in my hand. You are at my mercy. 
Who will save you now? Soldier to soldier. Man to man. As battles have to be fought. Not from 30,000 up in feet in the, in the sky. Carpet bombing and cluster bombing innocent civilians. Man to man. The blessed messenger was a very courageous soldier. He had the heart of a lion. Very calmly, very calmly he said, Allah will save me. And when he said that, the enemy began to tremble, shiver and shake and the sword fell from his hand. Immediately the blessed messenger picked up the sword, held it to his head. Tables were turned now. And he said, O enemy, who will save you from me now? Now you are at my mercy. Who will save you? He was not a believer. He said, O Muhammad, if you kill me, I shall be no more. If you spare me, I shall live. Now look at this. The blessed messenger offers him Islam. Accept my message. There is one God and I am his messenger. And join us. You become our brother. The man said, that I cannot do. Just imagine. The blessed messenger's reputation preceded him, followed him. People knew of his kindness. They knew of his generosity. This enemy knew. (coughs) Had he wanted to save his life, he could have said, yeah, okay, I believe in Islam, I believe in you, and then run off. But he knew he did not have to lie. He knew he did not have to deceive. He said, that I cannot do. I cannot accept that message. I can promise you one thing. I shall not fight you, nor assist those who fight you. Blessed Messenger said, that's good enough. Off you go. Let him go. An enemy soldier on the battlefield. He walked free. Walking back, he was dazed. He couldn't believe what had happened to him. He was struggling to understand. Why did Muhammad spare me? After all, I was about to kill him myself. Yet when he had the chance to do that to me, he spared me. Why? 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 And it dawned upon him that this was a true messenger of Allah. His message was a message of love, kindness, compassion and mercy. Not only did he embrace Islam, he went back to his people and he told them this story and scores of them became Muslim. That can happen today in Britain. It can happen here in Britain. But you and I have to make it happen. We have to stop hating people. They are fellow human beings. They are part of our human family. You hate what they do, the bad things that they do. For Allah's sake, don't hate them. You hate the drugs. You hate the drinks. You you hate the vices. But not the people who carry them out. We have to help them. We have to show them the light. We have to show them the path. We have to show our own, many of our own, the light and the path. Look at the story of Taif. Time has moved on. Is it okay if I continue for a few more minutes? Put your hands up when you've had enough. It's it's been a long day and quite a busy week, I know. And people will want to rest. I don't want to overburden you. And, And those who feel that it is time to go, please... Feel free to go, I, I will not mind. If you, if you have to leave, that's fine. The story of Taif, with that same feeling for humanity, that how can these people be saved from the fire of Jahannam? That was his only concern. I want to save every single human being that I can from the fire of Jahannam. These beautiful British people who are our neighbors and our fellow citizens, how can we save them from the fire of Jahannam? We should feel for them. It is our duty. Don't be misled by rhetoric from people who have violent extremist views about 
kafir this and Jew that and Christian that. Go back to the life of the blessed messenger. Look at what he did with the mushrikun. They were the worst of the enemies of Islam. They were out to finish Islam. Had they killed the blessed messenger, Islam would have been no more. That is why at the battlefield of Badr, the blessed messenger raised his hands and he said, O oh Allah, if today you do not look after these, 300, these, these few people, your name shall no longer be praised on this planet. It was that critical. Had the Muslims been defeated then, there would have been no one to say Allah's name. The words of the blessed messenger himself. They were the worst of enemies. Yet he cried for them. When he was stoned and thrown out of five by the people who rejected his message and he sat down to rest, clean his wounds, Jibril appeared, alayhi salam. Muhammad, Allah has sent me. Allah has seen what these people have done to you. How dare they treat you like this. Give me one command and I shall crush them between these two mountains and they shall be no more. We know what happened. The blessed messenger said, no, I am a source of mercy. How can I condemn them to a death of this nature, being crushed between mountains? That is not me. I am a mercy to all of mankind. If they do not acknowledge me, they do not accept my message, perhaps their children and their offspring will one day accept my message. Today the whole of, the whole of Taif is Muslim. Compassion, love for others, for fellow human beings. If each one of us does our own little bit, do your best. Just around your home, your immediate neighborhood, your work colleagues, your friends, the people that you play with, you socialize with. Just work on those small circles. If each one of us does that, if there are hundred of us here, we work with ten, we are reaching how many? My arithmetic is quite rusty. Which youngster is going to help me? Hundred times ten. Daddy, you need to give them loads of notes to practice counting. We'll reach a thousand people in no time. And I'll tell you, no matter what the television screens, the newspapers and the radios churn out against Muslims and Islam, they, that will not have a negative impact. Because the lived experience of our non-Muslim friends around us will tell them otherwise. They will say, that cannot be true. What the reporter is saying cannot be true because my Muslim neighbor would die for me. And if I may share something with you, and I say this, as gratefulness to Allah. Tahdith bin Ni'mah is one discipline within, within Muslim teachings that you, you share with others something about yourself, something that you have been blessed with as a way of thanking Allah for blessing you with that. I live with my family next door to... Actually we are sandwiched between two Hindu homes, two Hindu families. And I try my best to look after them. I have my shortcomings, many, many shortcomings. But I try my very best to look after them. Especially the neighbors on our left, elderly couple, just two. The old woman and the old man. And I try every, as much as I can to look after them. We've been neighbors for eleven and a half years or more. We have been given a key to their home to look after. And one summer, a few years ago, when I was clearing the yard and I had loads of black bags and all that lined up in the front, the old woman came outside of the house very worried. And she said, my son, you're not moving, are you? She was worried that Ibrahim's going to move out. Please don't go anywhere else, stay here. I said, don't worry, I'm only clearing up.
this is Allah's blessing on me that there is somebody next door who feels that I am a son to them and I treat them like I would treat my own parents because they are, they take the place of my parents as elderly neighbors and it is this kind of engagement inshallah that will drip by drip show people the true nature of Islam and the true nature of Muslims and I can stand here in the house of Allah and say to you I am so confident that she wouldn't swap me for a Hindu family to live next door to her inshallah each one of us can do things like this in your workplaces wherever you happen to be present a role model people will see how happy you are in your life how content you are how peaceful you are people are coming to Islam in this country despite all the negative publicity every single day handfuls of people coming to Islam I had the good fortune and blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that a Jewish professor from Nottingham University took shahada we sat in my office, we discussed and we talked a Jewish professor and here we are Jew this and Christian that and this and that why? they are fellow human beings if they have done something wrong Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was done so many, so many wrongs by people he forgave them he looked to the future to see how can this enemy of mine become a friend that is what the Quran says when it reminds us of how to engage with others with wisdom, with kind words with good manners, with good character that you will find that those with whom you were or they perceived, you, they, they, they perceived you to be their enemy all of a sudden you become as if you were brothers because of your good conduct your engagement with them we have a huge responsibility living in this society as Muslims society is full of problems, full of ills Islam has the solution to all those problems the answer for all those problems Islam can provide and it is us, the Muslims who have to take that solution out there into society to make it a better society, a peaceful society treat this country really as our country we are not here by chance Allah wants us to be here Allah meant for us to be here don't think that we came here because Idi Amin sent us out or this or that and the other that is part of Allah's plan believe you me Allah works in strange and mysterious ways beyond our comprehension we, can under, we cannot understand Allah's plan, His long term plan we were meant to be here had we not left those countries where we come from we would not have had more than 1200 masajid in Britain today 1200 places of worship official places of worship rang with the reading of Quran in a land of kufr think about it, just, just dwell over those things how many times Allah's name is mentioned on these aisles there is a reason for our presence on this, uh, in this country we have a huge responsibility let us work with our own families with our neighborhoods be nice to everyone, be kind to everyone somebody pulls out in front of you on the road what's the point in honking the horn and is it going to make any difference? he's pulled out, let him pull out and let him go what's the big deal? get a life as they say it makes me wonder sometimes that is there no compassion, no forgiveness no understanding yeah. so these are simple examples that I have used but you could apply them to all walks of life if we can become kinder people more loving, more caring you will see people will be attracted to our way of life inshallah and then Hidayah is in Allah's hands it is not in our hands it is not I who convinced the Jewish professor don't get me wrong I have no 
no right to claim anything in that process. I was simply a tool that Allah used and I'm blessed. It is not me, it is Allah. It is not me who brought him to Islam. Allah brought him. But Allah must have said, Ibrahim is doing, not doing much, he's just sitting around. Let's give him something to do. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. This is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was informed. When his most beloved uncle Abu Talib, he loved him dearly. He loved him so much. Because Abu Talib had always been nice to him. From his infancy. He protected him from his enemies. Despite not being a Muslim. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would say to my dear uncle, Say la ilaha illallah. My dear uncle, say la ilaha illallah. My dear uncle, say la ilaha illallah. Say it, just say it. On his deathbed, he's dying, he's leaving this world. Blessed messenger is pleading with him, please my uncle, please, just say it once and you will be successful. <coughs> Abu Talib said, no, I cannot do that. What will my tribe say? What will my people say? That an uncle gave in to the mission and to the message of his nephew? I cannot do that. And he died a disbeliever. Rasulullah was so hurt by this. He was so upset. He felt so low. Never in his life had he felt so low. He wept for him and he cried for him. My uncle has died without Iman. And Allah revealed the verse of the Quran. Innaka la tahdi man ahbabta walakinna Allah yahdi man yasha. Blessed Messenger, you do not give guidance to those who you love. You cannot pick and choose and say, Abu Talib, here is guidance, here is Islam, you become Muslim. Walakinna Allah yahdi man yasha. But it is Allah who guides whom He chooses, whom He wishes. But our job is to make that effort. Create those conditions. And inshallah Allah will guide. Jazakumullah khairan for listening to me so patiently. And I do apologize sincerely for taking longer, perhaps double the time that I had uh, uh, intended to take. And I hope that doesn't mean that I don't get a shot next year. Uh, but it's, it's one of those things that you have been such an engaging uh, audience. And Allah just puts words into people's minds and hearts and I hope that he will, he will help us change our attitudes so that we can truly be role models especially for our children for our families and our neighbors wa sallallahu ala nabil kareem wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen bi rahmatika ya rahim